Hi, this is Nurse Inga, and this week we're talking about hepatitis, or liver inflammation. The healthy liver is a large vascular organ that's located in the right upper quadrant up underneath the ribs and the diaphragm that's usually just barely palpable underneath the costal border. The functions of a healthy liver include the storage and the filtration of blood, production of bilirubin, synthesis of clotting factors, removal of clotting factors to prevent overclotting, and the metabolism of carbohydrates, fat, and protein. It also detoxifies the blood and stores our fat-soluble vitamins A, D, E, and K, as well as iron. Hepatitis is the inflammation of the liver. And when the liver is inflamed, hepatic dysfunction occurs, and the liver is no longer able to perform those essential functions. Therefore, there's a buildup of toxins, there's the inability to store adequate blood and blood products, fat-soluble vitamins are not stored, glycogen is not stored, and there's a decrease in the production of proteins such as albumin and the clotting factors that are necessary to promote healthy hemostasis. It can also lead to destruction or necrosis of hepatic tissues, the liver cells, if left untreated. The causes of hepatitis are viral infections, um, hepatitis viruses A through G, the use of alcohol, medications, or toxins, or autoimmune diseases. And there's two types of autoimmune diseases, type one and type two. The risk factors for autoimmune diseases include adolescent females, diabetes type 1, hyperthyroidism, ulcerative colitis, and proliferative glomerulonephritis. About 25% of people with chronic hepatitis will go on to develop cirrhosis or liver cancer. The onset of symptoms from exposure varies based on the type of hepatitis. From as little as two weeks to as many as 25 weeks, patients will go through the first prodromal phase, which is flu-like signs and symptoms, loss of appetite, malaise, lethargy, and fatigue. Patients with hepatitis B will present with the more classic signs and symptoms of fever, nausea, vomiting, right upper quadrant pain, epigastric pain, joint pain, and skin rashes. The icteric phase, meaning the jaundice phase, starts with the onset of jaundice. This occurs when the liver function has dropped so low that bilirubin is no longer cleared from the bloodstream. The accumulation of bilirubin in the bloodstream means that the bilirubin is now staining the skin and the tissues, that kind of yellowy color, um, including the sclera, and the kidneys start to clear it. So there's urobilinogen, and we have dark urine, and the stools become pale because the bile is no longer being transferred from the bloodstream into the GI tract. With the accumulation of these toxins that are normally cleared from the body also comes pruritus or itching. In the post icteric phase, so after the acute jaundice phase, a lot of times the jaundice will resolve and either the hepatitis infection was acute and it will heal and resolve itself within six months or it becomes chronic and the LFTs remain elevated and progressive liver damage will occur. So again, one of the key concepts is what is the connection between jaundice and clay colored stools? The liver breaks down the old red blood cells. It recycles that bilirubin into bile and then that's stored in the gallbladder and aids in digestion. The stools get their brown color from the bile salts. A liver that's not filtering red blood cells properly will cause a rise in serum or blood bilirubin levels and a decrease in gastric bile. It is the bile that stains things brown or kind of a yellow if you dilute it enough, and it is the excess bilirubin in the bloodstream that causes the jaundice. Let's review some of the specific types of hepatitis. Hepatitis A and E are very similar. 
They're spread by the oral fecal route, meaning that there's fecal contamination of food, water, or unclean hands that then makes it into the mouth and into the system. This presents as the GI bug or traveler's diarrhea, oftentimes referred to as Montezuma's revenge. This is an acute illness only and does not progress to chronic disease. For hepatitis A, there's a vaccination. For both, hand washing and proper food and water preparation is essential. They are both self-limiting and bismuth can be affected at treating hepatitis A. You may see jaundice with both of these. Hepatitis D and D are also similar. Hepatitis D cannot replicate in the body without a hepatitis B infection present first. Blood and other potentially infectious material, such as urine, feces, vomit, stool, semen, vaginal fluids, come in contact with mucous membranes or non-intact skin, and the disease spreads that way. Needle sticks and unprotected intercourse are the primary ways that hepatitis B and D are transmitted. The presentation is the stereotypical disease with the prodromal, icteric, and post-icteric phases. Prevention is ideally vaccine for hepatitis B, personal protective equipment, including gloves and condoms, and then don't share needles. Treatment includes the hepatitis B vaccine as part of the post-exposure plan if the person has not already been vaccinated, and then treatment with antivirals and interferons if they you know, have been exposed or if they are diagnosed. Hepatitis C is only blood to blood. It's a direct blood to blood contact. And this can be spread from the mother to the child during birth by sharing of needles, by blood transfusions with infected blood, or with tattoos or piercings when the needle is shared or if the equipment or ink is contaminated. Patients are oftentimes asymptomatic initially and for even long periods of time. The incubation period in hepatitis C can be up to 25 weeks. Prevention includes not sharing needles. The blood, blood bank screens the blood and treatment includes antivirals and interferons. Complications of hepatitis are essentially the same as the complications of cirrhosis because hepatitis oftentimes progresses into cirrhosis and or liver cancer. When the liver is not functioning properly and the waste products are not removed from the body, we have a buildup of ammonia. This can lead to neurological symptoms such as encephalopathy, insomnia, somnolence, or impaired mentation. We have impaired clotting and as well as splenomegaly. So we have decreased platelets, thrombocytopenia, coagulation disorders, and GI bleeds are very common. The patient can develop edema or ascites from decreased albumin production, oliguria, so decreased urine output, fever, and again, um, progression to cirrhosis and liver cancer. Medical management includes carefully monitoring liver function tests, alkaline phosphatase, albumin levels, bilirubin levels, and LDH. Medications include antivirals and interferons, and then antiemetics if the person is nauseated. The diet should focus on a low fat, high fruit, high veggie, whole grain diet. Small frequent meals are important. Avoid alcohol and hepatotoxic medications such as acetaminophen. You're going to need to supplement vitamins A, D, E, and K because the liver can't store those. Exercise should be things low impact, um, light walking, uh, gentle resistance training. <clears throat> Schedule rest and rest the liver so no toxins and really just allow it to heal if you can to prevent the acute hepatitis from becoming chronic. Surgical management includes a liver transplant. This is used most often for hepatitis C induced cirrhosis of the liver. Cadaver donors are the most common form of donor. Living donors can give a portion of their liver. Usually they give the right lobe. Complications of liver transplant include rejection and infection. 
Rejection usually occurs four to 10 days post-op. The person presents with the classic signs and symptoms of hepatitis, right upper quadrant pain, tachycardia, jaundice, and changes in bile drainage. We use anti-rejection medications such as cyclosporin to help decrease the risk of rejection. But about 80% of patients will develop an infection in the first year. And why is that? What's the relationship between rejection and infection? Well, the anti-rejection drugs are also immune suppression drugs. So they actually increase the risk of infection. Overall, your management of the patient with hepatitis should be to perform a good assessment, physical exam, vital signs, labs, intake and output, daily weights, and management of nutrition. Common nursing diagnoses for the patient with hepatitis include activity intolerance, altered nutrition, and altered thought process. This makes them at high risk for injury, falls, and infection as well as the bleeding and the whole nine yards. Your plan should be very collaborative with the patient, any care partners, and the healthcare team. Implement rest, safety, adequate nutrition, the appropriate medications, and patient and family teaching. Evaluate their knowledge, the overall health status, look for improvement, and the ability for self-care. Thanks for watching.